This video was recorded at the Spring Institute, March 2021. Our guest speaker in this video is Jean Clark, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Organization at Lyon Business School. Because I realized there was very little guidance out there for researchers who, who stumbled into this field and were interested in gestures, but weren't necessarily bang central in the gesture studies field. So people who were studying other things apart from gestures, but would like to incorporate gestures in their work. So that was the aim behind the paper. Um, gesture researchers tend to exist in highly sub -special, su specialist sub-disciplines, and they have very um, complex procedures sometimes that can be hard if you're a naive uh, observer to understand or a naive reader without having the contextual knowledge to understand what they're doing. So the attempt in this paper is to make the process simpler, to make it more understandable, and something that people can easily apply in their own research. Um, as I said, the, the context here is organizations, because that's where I'm doing my work. Um, I've been looking at entrepreneurial pitches in particular. So I've been looking at how entrepreneurs, so people pitching for investment, uh, use gestures uh, when they are pitching for investment and how that gestures, how those gestures impact on the investors and those people who are watching. So that's the context from where from where I'm coming from. Uh, but hopefully you'll see something relevant and it will be able you'll be able to apply it to your own research as well. I think after the presentation we're going to have some time as well to discuss how you could apply these ideas in your own research. Um, so I will just talk about how I've done it and then we can later talk together and in smaller groups about how it might be possible for you to do that. Um, okay, so Annika, could you just move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so just to give you an overview, um, I'll start to contextualize this with a sense of what a multimodal research agenda is. So I think multimodality, the, the idea that language is just one form of communication that, that us humans use, um, is becoming more and more prevalent across the social sciences. So we're becoming more aware that language and text are really just a very limited uh, part of the way that we communicate. And this undermines the whole of the multimodal agenda. So in the context of uh, organizations, this has become a much more uh, interesting topic that people are really jumping upon and that they're becoming a lot more interested in. There's more research coming out every year that incorporates aspects of multimodality, materiality, aspects of social interaction beyond just text and speech. Um, but I've noticed, or when I was doing my research, I noticed that gestures are a really important part of communication. So if you look at the gesture research and gesture studies, you start to see that gestures are actually core in terms of how we communicate as, as humans. So um, they're used alongside speech to emphasize speech. They're used to give different meanings to speech, to show uh, the, the size of objects, for example. They contextualize speech. They point people in different directions. They orientate us to other people. Um, but surprisingly, I found very little out there in terms of uh, being able to use the guidelines and how to do this in my own research. So and in organizational research, uh, there was really nothing on gesture. So this is where I started to, to think, you know, this might be a really interesting part. Um, this might be a really interesting topic to example to examine. Um, and I will discuss in the paper uh, two kind of core approaches that we have to gesture analysis. So there's conversation analysis, which is interest in gesture, and then there's people working in that area on gesture. And then there's also the area of cognitive linguistics. Um, and there's people really core, in, their core interest is gesture in that, in that arena of also. Um, so I will talk about those two approaches and how we sort of try to combine them in a way, or at least take parts from each um, and come up with a protocol that can be used uh, across, across the two uh, different um, perspectives. Okay, thanks, Annika. Just... Thank you. So just to give you a bit of context, uh, gesture studies is a multidisciplinary field. It's got many different uh, disciplines involved. So linguistics, the social, cognitive sciences, it takes often an experimental approach, not always, sometimes it's naturalistic, but there is quite a lot of experimental work in this area. Um, the idea behind gesture studies 
as um sorry i'm just getting a message here is that for me sorry there are folks that don't have hands at all or folks that are amputees absolutely um so I, in my research as i said I, i'm not looking at um disability in any sense and most of the people that i've been working with or coming across have been able bodied, bodied in that way but of course yeah i think that that would that is most definitely true i think people find other ways of communicating in that sense you know you, there's still ways of gesturing with the face um there's many different ways of, of gesturing but predominantly we use our hands and and our arms and but also our body to some extent as well so our torso can be used too but yeah it's a good point um gestures are characterized by a range of different um phases so we have the rest position so gestures start before so the rest position is when we are not really moving our hands then there's a preparation phase where the hand moves into the gesture the stroke phase is where the, the core of the gesture happens, so the real movement of the gesture, uh, the, the, the part that we're most interested in, you know, if it's the point, the pointing gesture, or if it's, you know, the, the illustrating a, a round object, it will be the hands moving in a circle uh, to illustrate the, the object you're talking about. This is called the stroke phase. And then the retraction phase is when we move our hands back into the position that they were prior to the gesture. There's also a range of um, different types of classifications for gestures, and some of the terms differ between uh, the, the various uh, disciplines that approach gestures and look at gestures. So we have beat gestures, which are predominantly marking gestures, gestures that help the speaker to parse or to segment uh, parts of their speech. So the hand might move up and down to really show an important point. Politicians, for example, often use this gesture. It's it's the way of showing, I really want you to pay attention to what I'm talking about. Uh, so it marks parts of the speech, it emphasizes, it, it draws importance uh, to what the speaker is saying. There's pra pragmatic gestures, which you orientate to other people. So you might you know, gesture towards something um, or point towards something. So didactic and pragmatic gestures are quite, quite similar and can overlap. And then there's representational gestures, which conjure objects um, or persons or spatial relations. So you might use your hands, for example, to illustrate the size of something. Um, it's very small or it's very big, or this is the shape. Um, or it can also show the per aspects of the person, for example, or ideas or spatial relations. It was very far, for example. Um, so representational gestures illustrate ideas or objects. Okay, thanks, Anka. Okay, so just to kind of recap on conversation analysis versus cognitive linguistics, um, research questions in conversation analysis, they pose questions how, for example, um, practical, there's a practical accomplishment of tasks and um, how people orientate towards each other. Um, they look at the sense making of participants, how people understand what other people are going to do in the moment. So they're not interested potentially in what's going on in people's minds or what people think about the situation or how they think they should act. But really it's very practical in terms of if that person does this, what does the in the interlocutor, the person they're talking to, how do they respond and what do they do? How do they make sense of the situation? So human beings are always interacting, trying to make social uh, interactions okay, trying to make them function. And it can be quite interesting to look at the finer detail of how that happens. So that's really what um, conversation anal analysts are interested in. Um, it can often be, it's very, very intricate work. So you really, really, looking at the data from a very, very micro uh, analysis perspective. The, the transcription is very, very micro. Things that we wouldn't, as qualitative researchers, necessarily pay attention to. So a, a movement of the head, um, a slight turn of the shoulder will be of immense interest to a conversation analyst, for example. Um, so that's the kind of perspective that, that conversation analysis comes from. Okay, thanks, Annika. And then we also have uh, cognitive linguistics. So cognitive linguistics comes from the Lakoff and Johnson perspective, which suggests it's, it's a theory called conceptual metaphor theory. And the theory suggests 
that we think metaphorically because our language is so metaphorical and language has a big impact on how we we think um, and they suggest if this is true then we should be able to see metaphors coming out in in terms of our body language in our speech metaphors should be everywhere in terms of how we express ourselves um, so what they're interested in in terms of gesture is trying to examine gestures to see if this supports their theory of conceptual metaphor theory that metaphoric understanding is really the core of how human beings make sense of the world so again there's quite a different approach to um to analysis in cognitive linguistics they're very much focused on what is going on in the mind of the individual as opposed to uh, to conversation analysis, which is very much not interested in the internal or the cognition going on behind the in, in, internally to the person. Um, cognitive linguistics is very much focused on, on this aspect. Okay. Thanks, Annika. Okay, so just a recap really in this slide. Um, the, there's different gesture types, as I mentioned. So there's representational gestures. Uh, there's pragmatic gestures, didactic gestures, um, and some theories are more interested in different types of gestures. So cognitive linguistics, for example, is really interested in representational gestures because the core of their work is how to understand metaphors that, that are evident in speech, that are evident in gestures, that are evident in, in any ways that we communicate. Um, whereas pragmatic and didactic gestures are really the core of conversation analysis because it's a very interactionist perspective. They're really interested in how people accomplish things together rather than how the individual is thinking internally. So quite different, but um, what we were trying to do is sort of take the, both aspects, both parts of the, both theories that we found interesting and useful and bring them into one protocol that could be easily used by those who might be interested in looking at um, in looking at uh, gestures. I'm just, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at Oana. Oh, okay. Yeah, just ignore it. I'm just managing the room in the background. Okay, no problem. Okay, so the context of where I'm looking at this is the entrepreneurial pitches. So I'm guessing not many of you are working in the area of entrepreneurship or even organizations, um, but I'm sure many of you will have seen these popular kind of shows like in the UK, it's Dragon's Den, I think it's called Shark Tank in the US. <clears throat> you know, pitches are very important to cultural, even culturally, people know about entrepreneurial pitches. Um, they're really important for entrepreneurs because they have this very small time slot in which to sell their business uh, to get investors on side, and they have to be really effective communicators. Um, entrepreneurs often suffer from what we call the liability of newness. So they're new, they don't have a track record necessarily. They're not profitable as yet. So people who are making the decision to um, invest in a company uh, they are the, the odds are stacked against the entrepreneurs. There's a lot to for them to to get over in that sense, much more than people in established organizations. So they face a lot of challenges. And that's why it's a particular particularly interesting area to look at communication. Because it's so essential, research suggests that if entrepreneurs communicate better in pitches, they're more likely to get funding. Entrepreneurs and investors also can build up a sense of understanding, a sense of they understand each other and who the other person is. Uh, investors get a gut feel for the entrepreneur. And how these things emerge is really through this process of communication. Um, much of the work that's been done in this area, although there are a few exceptions, have really been focused on the communication in terms of narratives, in terms of storytelling, um, in terms in terms of rhetoric and how entrepreneurs use speech to be persuasive. But what we are interested in, what I, I've been interested in, is the fact that you know we don't just look at what people say or how they say it. We look at what people are doing with their bodies. So focusing only on the speech 
is giving you a very small element of understanding into how communication processes function. So when we see somebody in a room, uh, when we meet somebody, before they even speak, we have a, a sense of who they are, an understanding of what they might be like. Um, of course, this understanding might change as we interact with them, but the point is that we get a sense and an understanding of people uh, from much more than just what they say. And this, is, this was the interest in, in entrepreneurial pitches. Thanks, Annika. Okay, so we came up with a six step protocol um, and hopefully you've read the paper, so I won't go into too much detail about all the steps. Um, there's a data collection step, of course, so that's step one. We based it on 54 uh, video recorded investor pitches. Uh, the entrepreneurial pitches uh, were videotaped, um, which is quite normal. So in, in these kind of settings, they're often videotaped so that the next time they can do better. Um, they might be working with somebody coaching them, for example, who will say, you know, this could have been done better. Uh, so they're used to it. And that's my point. It's not that they had a video or camera in front of them and they were um, you know, surprised or um, put off or embarrassed. You know, it's a very normal thing to have a video camera in these settings. Um, the, the, the disappointment for us or the problem for us was that although they're used to having a video camera on front of them, they're not really used to being videotaped from multiple angles, which is what we initially wanted to do. So we wanted to have a video, video in BAM face, um, face to face or a face uh, profile and a, a one to the side and then one with the investors and the, the entrepreneurs said so that would have been ideal for us. We also thought about the idea of having a roving camera, so moving the camera around um, as the entrepreneurs uh, were speaking and uh, as they interacted with the investors. But we felt this was too um, obtrusive in the end. So you know we have limitations in that way that we just have this kind of one angle camera uh, data base. So it would be much more interesting to have the interactions of the the, um, the investor and the entrepreneur. So that could be a learning point for you as you go forward. That if you have uh, the possibility to videotape the two people speaking, it's it's a much better approach. Okay, so the first, uh, sorry, the second step after we collected the data was trying to get a rough idea of what we felt was going on in the in the gestures and among the, the entrepreneurs and what they were doing with their gestures, um, which we kind of call the entrepreneurial gesture code. Um, and we, we found the seven recurrent hand gestures that we saw in other literature as well. So we didn't come up with these uh, names. Um, most of them have been seen in other uh, research as well, uh, but we thought it was quite interesting that they were all used and it was quite a limited number of, of hand gestures that were being used. Uh, so I'll just talk briefly a bit about each one of, of these seven hand gestures. Okay, so I think Annika, if you click on them, they should move. Um, Okay, maybe not. Um, no. Are you using a Mac? Maybe. Sometimes they don't work on a Mac. Um, okay, yes, that's I no am. <laughs> okay, okay, that's no problem. Um, okay, so we might not be able to see the videos because uh, they don't. They're not working. They don't work on Mac for some reason. Um, okay, so the first one is the cutting or slicing. I can just describe to you what's, what would happen in the cutting or slicing movement. So the hands would be brought up sort of just above the waist and the hands would move either towards each other, uh, flat with the palm down, and then in quite a dramatic movement, slice or cut uh, in a, outwards from the body. So they would move and cut and slice. And we noticed that entrepreneurs were using this a lot um, to to negate things. So I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, you know, this is not going to be a problem for you. So then they would use a cutting slicing movement as if to cut the problem away or slice the problem away. You know, it's 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 gone. It's it's not a problem. Um, so that was one of the ways that uh, cutting or slicing was used, often in a negation type of of way. The second type was uh, drawing shapes. So. No, it is what it sounds. It's it's quite descriptive. Um, entrepreneurs illustrated things with their hands. It could be a range of things, you know, numbers or 
illustrating the distance between things, a very descriptive form of using um, gestures. There's also the M form, which was when the hands moved outwards uh, in towards the body in the shape of an M, and also the outward M form, which when, was when the, the hands moved from a position internally to the body, so in an, in an M already, and then outwards. I'm not sure if my descriptions are excellent here, Anna, Annika, so please do feel free to ask your uh, person who can describe them better um, if, you, if, you, if you need to. Okay, could you just move the slide on, please? Okay, and then there's the, the M form. That was the other alternative M form that I already spoke about. So the, the M going outwards. Then there was the precision grip. So this was as if you're holding something in between your index finger and your thumb often. So it's a way of expressing uh, this is very important or specificity in specificity in something. So it's really, you know, this is really the core element of what I'm talking about. Um, and it's also, again, often used by politicians to really show it's a really important point. Uh, parsing, again, is what I, I spoke about earlier, which is the beat kind of gestures. So the, the point of um, marking speech, um, the element of show something is important. So it's really just an up and down movement with the hand, uh, one hand with a palm um, facing uh, sideways and up and down, uh, potentially backwards and forwards, so from side to side of the body. So really a very repetitive movement. And then there was also didactic gestures. That's pointing gestures, but I, I didn't include an example in these videos that unfortunately you're not able to see. Okay, thanks, Annika. Okay, so this is just really a, a summary of what I've been talking about. So the cutting or slicing is a negation. Drawing shapes in the air is often for demarcation. So for showing how things relate to each other in a, in a spatial tableau. Um, M form from the inside out is expansion. So it's, uh, you know, something is growing. Uh, M form outside in is often for combining things to show that, that some elements are being combined in a product or an idea. Um, the ring, as it's called here, is um, the specificity, specificity, I can't say that word today, I don't know why, um, and parsing gestures, uh, listing or packaging, and pointing um, is for directing attention, of course. Okay, I think we need to move on again, it's just, yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, so we, are, we firstly have a, we firstly bring the gestures and the speech together to see how they, they interact. And this is the, the third step in the protocol. And we see sometimes that gestures uh, reflect speech. So in this example, he's talking about his product, which is something that is used to um, finish roads. So with tarmac. Um, and he is again here use, using the negation um, gesture that I've just talked about. So at the end, he says, um, he says, first of all, he says, just to give you a more holistic description of what's happening, um, you've got 30, a 30 ton, ton tanker of polymer modified bitumen requires 600 tons of finished mix, which is about 20 tons of, sorry, 20 trucks of finished mix. You don't have to worry about that. In a way, the context is not important. It's quite technical because he's talking about this specific product. But the point is, at the end of you know the, the problem that he's illustrated, he says, you don't have to worry about that. And then he uses his hands as a way of cutting out the problem. You know, this, is not, this is not important. You don't have to worry about that. OK, gestures that embellish, embellish speech. Again, uh, here we see that the, the gesture is kind of adding something extra to the speech. So he's showing um, that he's exaggerating really with the speech. So he says, this text doesn't make much sense because it, it's very specific, um, but he's describing the way that his product, product makes um, money and why, why it's uh, beneficial. Um, and he says, if you think, 3,000 bitumens, 500, and ground rubber tire is 140. 
Um, his, there's, so I, on, this, on the picture I've marked out uh, where he uses his hand to show the numbers. So at the very bottom of the image, you see um, where he mentions 140, there is a, there's a, there's a, a line. And then when he mentions uh, 500, there's another line. The 140 line is just uh, at the top of his chest. The 500 line is at the very top, almost at the very top of his head, whereas the line for 3000 is just above his head. Obviously, there's a, a bigger difference between 500 and 3000, um, but he makes a bigger show of the difference between the 140 and the 500 because this is where his product um, can make the difference. So he's almost exaggerating how good his product is by, by illustrating these elements. It's quite hard to describe it actually without um, without seeing it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Annika, that's clear for you, um, but hopefully uh, it's uh, it's okay. I'm fine if you need somebody to explain that further <laughs> because it's quite complicated. And um, somebody's asking me how consciously were these gestures used? Um, and for the second question, absolutely yes. You see that all the time where. Um, people use inconsistent gestures, gesture-speech combinations. And one other stream of research that I've been looking at is the impact of when you have inconsistent gesture-speech combinations, how that can affect um, investors and if that is a problem. Um, yeah, these are interesting questions. So I think there's a sense of, you know, are the entrepreneurs manipulating or trying to manipulate people? Are they using these gestures consciously? Are they being coached to use these gestures? I think in a, a, to a certain extent, they are being coached to use gestures, but there's not enough known about gestures and how gestures function for a coach to be able to say, you know, if you do this, then you will look more convincing. The people who coach gestures are basing it just on their own experience as, you know, people watching investment um, pitches. So they usually say things like, you know, be more animated with your gestures, you know, use your hands to express things, but they won't, they won't give advice as specific as that. And I really don't think that this person uh, is doing this consciously. I think, you know, it's, it's something that he has, he's done because he wants to emphasize it, but I don't think he's trying to manipulate or be strategic in a way. I think it's his way of communicating. Um, and there's another question, is there a difference between women and men? Um, I haven't noticed any differences, but then I haven't had massive samples, so I wouldn't be able to say definitively or not if there's a difference between men, men and women so far. Okay, thanks, Annika. Okay, so I don't think we can see this because um, because the video is not working. But basically, this same <laughs> entrepreneur is uh, pointing he points to the back of the room to show that some elements of his uh, product are at the back of the room. And what's interesting in the video is that he points before he says anything. So the gesture kind of preempts the speech. So the, the, the gesture happens first, he points, and then he talks about where the products are. And what's quite interesting in that video, which you know you'd see, um, is that somebody in the audience, when he points, uh, moves their head round and, round and turns uh, to the left and looks over her shoulder to see the back of the room. So in terms of a conversation analysis approach, it's quite interesting because you see the person orientating towards the gesture, that they notice the gesture and they adapt and move and change their interaction based on that. Again, yes, the step four is link the gestures and speech to material context. So, you know, people uh, don't exist in a world without any material objects. All the time we're interacting with, with objects. Uh, so, for example, PowerPoint and, and these um, clickers that people use, we found this really uh, interrupted the flow of gestures. So in this example, there's people kind of adapting their gesture use with, with the clicker in their hand. And we see them sort of doing the same gestures, but adapted to hold the clicker. Um, and what we noticed as well was that when they put down the clicker, uh, their gestures suddenly opened up again. So they were free and they began to gesture more fulsomely again. Um, so these kind of uh, material objects can impact in terms of how you use your gesture. They also orientated a lot to the PowerPoint slides in terms of 
you know, pointing to them, using gestures to, to refer to the PowerPoint slides. So I think an important element is how gestures and speech and the material context interact. And it's, an, it's another important step to consider. Um, yes, again, this is analyzing the, the interactional and uh, pragmatic functions of the gestures, so how people orientate to the gestures in the audience. Um, this is the same clip again that I just spoke about. So he's pointing to something on the slide, and then the person in the audience orientates towards the place that he's just pointed. He points to the slide and then to the back of the room, and then the person turns their head. In the, in the example on the left-hand side, um, this gentleman has just finished his, his pitch and he, a person in the audience, he sees a person in the audience with a question and he puts up his hand as if in a stop symbol. So if you weren't listening to the, the text and what's happening, you would think he was saying, you know, stop, I don't want to hear anymore, I don't want any questions. But what he's actually doing is uh, orientating towards that person and saying, it's now your turn to speak. So he, he puts a, a flat hand uh, upwards with the palm facing outwards and uh, moves it slightly forward to say your turn to speak so you know there's a we see these all the time these these this use of gestures for interactional functions to allow people to speak to allow them to know it's now your turn to speak um, and and this is another important element that needs to be considered when we look at gestures Thanks, Annika, yeah. Okay, so the final step is more the cognitive linguistic element. Um, and we see lots of metaphoric content in this example. Um, so for example, we see, he says, we spent the next 18 months creating a built for purpose product to actually sit down or nail down these difficult infrastructures. And at the point he says nail down, he uses his hand almost in the shape of a spider and like pushes it down to illustrate like a nailing down um, of the object. Uh, then towards the end of the slide uh, from line 13 onwards, he says, so you end up with many potential security holes. Um, and this is the problem that his company is trying to nail down. And when he talks about this, he actually uses his hand again in quite an interesting way where he is almost illustrating that there is security holes in front of him and he starts to plug them in with his hands. So again, this time he uses a spider gesture almost, but this time with the pan, the pan facing towards the audience and starts to make a gesture as if he's putting things into holes all around uh, his body space. Um, so then we see that, you know, nail down is quite a common idiomatic expression. We, we use it all the time without thinking about the metaphoric content of it. But here we see that he's actually really thinking about it in quite a, 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 in quite a metaphoric way. So he's thinking of the holes that he needs to plug. Um, and he's trying to physically do this and illustrate to the audience that this is what's going to happen. Okay, and then again, this is another metaphoric example. Um, he is talking about the, the brand and it's a, it's a company that can um, make your social media presence better or give you a better social media presence. Um, and it's quite interesting what he's doing, particularly from line 10 onwards. So he says, um, when he's talking about corporate social media accounts, they're not really driving it down to where it really matters. And when he says driving it down to where it really matters, he uses his both of his hands, the right hand is, is up at shoulder level, and he pushes it down towards his left hand, which is at waist level, with the palms open towards each other, as if he's really pushing something down, driving it down. So he physically represents this, this movement, this, this this uh, beneficial um, aspect that this company can particularly provide for, for the, the investors. So he's driving it down, physically forcing it uh, down with his hands. Uh, and we see lots of these um, metaphoric gestures in uh, throughout all of the pitches. They're just two examples. <clears throat> okay, so this is just um, 
a slide to kind of illustrate the, the different elements of, of um, cognitive analysis and cognitive, cognitive linguistics and um, you know how they kind of specialize on, on different aspects of communication. And what we try to do is sort of take all of those elements and bring them into this, um, this approach, uh, this protocol for, for analysis. So we don't just look at how people orient towards gestures <clears throat> and how they create in, in situ sense making, how they create understanding between each other, but we also look at the underlying sense making process of the individual and how they, how they make sense in the situation, how they use this to try and transfer their understanding, their internal understanding to the investors. Okay, um, and again, I don't think I need to go into this because I, I've talked quite a lot about the differences between, um, between cognitive ling linguistics and conversation analysis. So I'll let you look at that in your own time. Um, just a brief sum up of what we've been discussing or what I've been discussing. Um, the aim of the paper uh, was really to build an accessible protocol that people can use if they're interested in gestures, uh, it, which is our, a largely overlooked modality of organizational communication. <clears throat> Prior to our paper, at least in organizational studies, but more general, I think, in the social sciences, uh, gesture research has been quite niche. It's been difficult to access because you really need a lot of uh, understanding of the various fields to be able to build these, these, this kind of work into your own work. Um, what we try to do is get a holistic understanding of gesture studies and build this into a, a simple-ish protocol that people can use um, to, to build this in their own work across the social sciences. Um, and what we think is interesting is that although there's so many different types of gestures, speakers really just use quite uh, a narrow repertoire. And we would be interested in finding out if this also happens uh, in, in other contexts. So that would be a really interesting way to expand on this research. Um, and we consider the overlapping and complementary aspects of of conversation analysis and cognitive linguistics, which have generally before been quite separate fields. So we hope that, you know, in that way it can offer something to people who want to look at both internal aspects and, and mental sense making, but also how people interact and how they make sense together, how they make situations okay, how they, how they function, how they communicate. Thanks very much for watching. You can like and subscribe to our channel below. We're currently working on a British Academy funded project looking at the lived experience of disabled people during the pandemic. And you can find out what we're up to at tendproject.com or on Twitter at tendproject. Thank you.